way, uh, this morning I would like us to recall the core values that were practiced by one of the most prophetic and impactful leaders this nation has ever known. A husband of one, father of four, pastor, author, Nobel laureate, and disciplined disciple of peace, love, and nonviolence, who gave his life for freedom, human justice, and the better being of the systemically oppressed. And yet, I would be remiss this morning if I did not address the rogue elephant, not in the room or on Zoom, but in our nation's capital and comment on what just occurred and on the danger we still face from those unhinged, misguided people who have abandoned their God-given intelligence and all sense of humanness. I'm disappointed and saddened yet again, but given my own lifelong experiences, I am not at all surprised. But I do offer my empathy and compassion to all those who've been negatively affected and continue to be and not only with this drama in our capital, but also with those who suffer from the virus, which is really, really quite a challenge to us all. I'll leave it here for now, but it's clear that people of conscience and people of genuine goodwill have a deeper kind of work to do. And that work will be explained and expressed both directly and indirectly as I move along. I venture to say that few people truly appreciate the theological principles and the deeply held spiritual convictions that guided and sustained Dr. King. And although he was a third generation pastor and deeply anchored in the Christian stream of spirituality, he readily accepted the validity of all faith traditions and worked with clergy from all religions. In fact, it was a hairless Hindu with a very small wardrobe by the name of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, whose method of Satyagraha, translated from the Sanskrit as holding to truth, that informed the strategic and tactical framework for what is best termed the Rosa Parks Martin Luther King movement. Reverend Dr. King often lamented the dearth of social ethics and human values in our nation and the archaic racial injustices, which he said were as native to our soil as pine trees, sagebrush, and buffalo grass. He said that our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power and that we have guided missiles and misguided men. Much can be said about best methods and best practices for progressive engagement. And yet, Dr. King knew that the means was just as important as the end and needed to be as pure and unsullied as the noble goals for which he worked. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that, he said. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Hate multiplies hate. Violence multiplies violence. And toughness multiplies toughness. In a descending spiral of destruction, the chain reaction of evil, hate begetting hate, and wars producing more wars must be broken. I have believed in principled practice throughout my life and earned my own stripes back in the day with multiple nonviolent protests and being placed under arrest for inciting to riot when I was really inciting justice. And yet in recent years, I find that I am emphasizing universal unity, practical spirituality, selfless service, and the all encompassing value of love. Because after all the research and study, all the living and traveling abroad, and all the self-inquiry and deep reflection, I have concluded, like many of you, that to achieve a life worth living and to move towards the eternal goal of moksha or spiritual liberation, love and its broad, 
conscious and rightly focused expressions must be present. All noble goals can be subsumed under love. Ideologies have goals. Political and economic activities have a purpose. But what if that purpose was infused with love for equal justice, for equal access to the means for a healthier life, and for the best being of all? Dr. King reminded us that it takes strength to love. When I speak of love, he said, I am not speaking of some sentimental or weak response. I am speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality, he said, is summed up in the first epistle of St. John. Let us love one another. Shams of Tabriz, Rumi's mentor and teacher said, a life without love is of no account. Don't ask yourself what kind of love you should seek, spiritual or material, divine, mundane, or Eastern or Western. Divisions only lead to more divisions. Love has no labels, no definitions. It is what it is, pure and simple. Love in thought is truth and right view. Love in feeling is peace. Love in action is morality and right living. Love in understanding is nonviolence. Love fulfills. Love liberates and activates. Love cures pettiness and it binds all hearts. Love is the prime motivator in all of the cosmos. And love truly is one's only lasting possession. At the elementary levels, love is experienced as an emotion. Yet that is its least expression. Love is the energy that attracts us to the good. It is dedication and determination in the pursuit of progressive human-centered means and socially just effects on those whose voices and dignity have been silenced and degraded. Love is the concrete expression of the do unto others outlook of life. Consciously or unconsciously, all sentient beings somehow know that love is everything. Love is truly the water of life, but not love merely in the abstract or in words. Love must be shared and made manifest. Otherwise, what good is it? Sitting in our pocket or limited to those who love us? What good is it? In speaking about love, Mother Teresa once said something very simple, yet very profound. Many people talk about love, she said, but they may not be very loving at all. Love has to be put into action. And when it is, love takes the forms of understanding, compassion, devotion, trust, generosity, sincerity, friendship, and service. Freedom and social justice arrive whenever and wherever those in power, authority, and those who hold influence uphold the common good and acquire the courage to place compassion into action. People find the correct way when the power of love is present. Healthcare and education are not tied to politics and economics when love is at hand. Schools are not segregated, underfunded, or held captive to political imposition or benign neglect when love is there. Poverty and racism cannot coexist when love is alive and active. Children don't go too far astray 
when there is tangible evidence that they are loved and respected and are provided with appropriate avenues to experience and express the love that lives within their own delicate hearts. They learn from what we do and from what they witness. Children behaving badly are almost always the direct result of parents and elders behaving badly. And they learn just as much from our disregard as they do from our commitments. During the Montgomery bus boycott in 1957, Dr. King stated, we cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. Later, he upped the ante. Cowardice asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asked the question, is it politic? Vanity asked the question, is it popular? But conscience asked the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but one must take it because it is right. Social progress largely results from social movements, but social movements are always a function of the values, the priorities and characteristics of leadership and of the people involved. We must be assertive in suggesting alternatives and aggressive in defending fairness and social justice. We must lift the illusion that we are not our brothers or our sister's keeper. Thus, it is only when we each do the inner and more elevated work of harmonizing our own thoughts, our own words and actions with a compassionate conscience, only when we address our own uncertainties, doubts, fears, hesitations, and illusory sense of the other, can we ever hope to teach our children well and experience peace, love, and justice in our families, our institutions, and communities? Surely you have heard that what we really need is a revolution of values a more enlightened way of seeing ourselves and our relationships. This revolution of values, according to Dr. King, means that our loyalties must escape the limitations and expectations of the roles that we play and the identities of distinction we have assumed and become broad and ecumenical and all-inclusive. We must achieve ever deeper understanding and embrace a command of the dialectics that lead to progress. Now, I realize that I'm largely preaching to a live and awake Unitarian Universalist. You have done some very fine service and social justice work, which must be acknowledged and encouraged. But let us never be discouraged let us continue to act with ever increasing conviction, determination, resilience, and love. As well-known poet, author, and activist Audre Lorde said, none of these struggles is ever easy. And even the smallest victory must be applauded because it is easy not to battle at all, to just accept and then to call that acceptance inevitable. It wasn't until my own elementary school days in Chicago that all Americans became equal under the law. And yet, as we clearly know, that was mere de jure and a galaxy away from equal access and opportunity in fact. The evidence is as overwhelming as it is appalling. It is not easy to accept that so much and yet so little 
has changed since Dr. King walked and worked among us. In fact, white nationalism and white supremacy were on full and horrific international display in our nation's capital in ways that you and I have never seen. And this happened when? Over 150 years since the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment. It happened 67 years after the 1954 Supreme Court decision to end US apartheid. 58 years since the March on Washington. It happened 56 years after John Lewis was beaten in Selma and 53 years after Dr. King's assassination. Lots of years gone by, lots of business as usual, lots of apologies and revisionist history and lots of untold and truly unnecessary community and family misery. Of course, I could cite all manner of telling and depressing statistics, but why bother? It is like the man who found momentary courage as he was walking along an unfamiliar street one day and later told the story. I could hardly believe my eyes when I saw the name of the shop, the truth shop. The saleswoman was very polite. What kind of truth did I wish to purchase, partial or whole? The whole truth, of course. No deceptions for me, no defenses, no rationalizations. I wanted my truth plain and unadulterated. She waved me on to another side of the store. The salesman there pointed to the price tag. The price is very high, sir, he said. What is it? I asked, determined to get the whole truth, no matter what it costs. The price is your security, sir. I came away with a heavy heart. I realized that I still needed the safety of my own unquestioned beliefs. The problems we face are not problems of competence or wherewithal. These are not problems we cannot solve. They are and always have been moral problems that affect us all. Yet too many prefer to push them into complex abstraction in their attempts to avoid the painful truth that as a nation, America has always cared more for its money, its pride, its optics, and its access to other people's resources much more so than the welfare of their own marginalized and suffering people. We are a uniquely wealthy nation with incredible wherewithal and mind boggling ingenuity and potential. And with the right values and the right priorities, we have the capacity to humanely and completely refurbish our healthcare and social security systems our hospitals and schools, our roads and bridges and levees, all could be working, all could be assured of a worthy education and quality health care, all could rely on a social contract that would preserve dignity and extend opportunities for a more meaningful and productive life. When will we bring honor to the human condition? When will we realize that education without character business without morality, science without humanity, and politics without principles are not only useless, but can quickly become positively dangerous. What good are principles without practice and words without deeds? Our hearts must be heard in our voices and felt through our actions. Surely we know that this is not really about Dr. King. It is about you and me. It is about what we have come to understand about the meaning and purpose of life and how we support, empower, and serve each other. How we spend our time, how we spend our money and our energy, how assertive we are when teaching our children 
by word and by example that racism, sexism, ageism, and discrimination of all kinds is wrong and will not be tolerated. It is about how we supervise and teach, how we interact with our coworkers, which businesses we support, what and where we consume, how we dispose of our waste, and how convenience and thirst for cheap apparel and inexpensive toys support sweatshops, pollution, job loss, and labor exploitation. Today, King speaks to us like never before. He is urging us to be true human beings, to be more deliberately mindful, to be ever more conscientious and to help bring an end to the bold hypocrisies and contradictions that have pledged, uh, plagued our nation and its people since its inception. I will be more courageous. I will be more compassionate. I will be a better parent, a better father, mother, sister, brother, friend, and coworker. Whatever I do, I will do it with greater mindfulness with a renewed and more persistent commitment to what is just, what is right, and what is good. So in closing, and to push this to the highest levels of universal Unitarianism, to the level of true Advaita or non-duality, let me simply suggest a wonderful game that the great Sufi poet Hafiz contrived. There is a wonderful game we should play and it goes like this. We hold hands and look into each other's eyes and scan each other's face. Then I say, now tell me a difference you see between us. And you might respond, Hafiz, your nose is 10 times bigger than mine then I would say, yes, my dear, almost 10 times, but let's keep playing. Let's go deeper, go deeper. For if we do, our spirits will embrace and interweave. Our union will be so glorious that even God will not be able to tell us apart. There is a wonderful game we should all play with everyone and it goes like this. Thank you.